this is Joe Massio, and uh, Joe will be talking about directional preference of the wrist preliminary investigation. Welcome, Joe. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, it is a, it's truly an honor to, uh, to be here, um, uh, especially to be uh, presented by such a well-esteemed uh, researcher here. Uh, it makes it even, even better. Uh, as Richard said, I'm going to be presenting uh, a study that I did on uh, looking at directional preference uh, at the wrist. Um, it is uh, currently uh, in submission to JMNT under its second round of revisions, which uh, so far has, has surprisingly been going quite well. Um, we are hopeful that the, the, it will be available to the public in the next few months. Um, given my previous experience with publishing research, it's probably about two years, so <laughs> hang in there. We'll get it. Um, I, I think I should disclose, uh, until uh, this conference, I didn't realize that people uh, were receiving money for doing research. I've been doing this for free. Uh, <laughs> long nights and weekends. <laughs> well, I mean, any of the people that are funding, you know, the, the, it seems like a hundred of Chet funding Chad Cook, uh, it was our out there. <laughs> well, I mean, any of the people that are funding, you know, the, the, it seems like a hundred of Chet funding Chad Cook, uh, it was our out there, and they're interested. Uh, I think I'd, I'd be willing to take that on if uh, it's available. So we'll it grab me, yeah, that'd be great. Um, okay, so I know we have a, I have a, a limited time constraint here, so I got to get back to it. Um, so, after this weekend especially, we should have a pretty good handle on directional preference. Uh, for those of us that may have uh, been out uh, in South Beach late, late last night, I'll go ahead and just redefine it for you. So, directional preference is a phenomenon that occurs in musculoskeletal disorders uh, when one specific movement causes a rapid change in pain, range of motion, strength, or function. Its presence is associated with improved symptomatic, and functional outcomes. In the spine, the prevalence of directional preference is heavily researched with over 50 studies regarding its presence. The prevalence ranges from 60 to 78 percent. The prevalence of directional preference in extremity disorders is much less researched. There's only been three publications regarding its presence, which found prevalence rates of 19, 37, and 40, which was actually done by Richard Rosedale. Um, so much lower so far uh, re reporting in, in the research. Although there is an increasing trend, it's unclear why extremity directional preference is so much less. In May and Rosedale's 2012 study, they theorized this may be the result of a learning curve. The learning curve can be attributed to the relative newness of MDT extremity evaluation, lack of MDT extremity curriculum in diplomats receiving training prior to the mid-90s, as well as the historical bias of MDT clinicians treating predominantly spinal conditions. It also may be that there's just less directional preference in the peripheral joints. This discrepancy in prevalence was one of the prompting factors in the creation of this study. In the study, we aim to examine the process of finding directional preference in the extremity joints. Four examiners were used for data collection, evaluation, and treatment. MDT education uh, ranged from a therapist with a diploma, which is myself, and a student with no formal MDT coursework. Examiners were trained in MDT risk evaluation prior to data collection, and all patient management was overseen by myself. Uh, patients were recruited through the normal business operations of my place of employment, Masio Physical Therapy. The criteria for establishing directional preference was significant improvement in pain, motion, or function as the direct result of repeated movement testing. The predetermined variables analyzed were mechanical stress, directional vulnerability, most painful movement, most obstructive movement, 
uh, and these variables were decided upon by previous evidence and clinical experience. The most significant finding was that of the 19 evaluated patients, 79% were classified as risk arrangement with directional preference. This is the highest prevalence to ever be recorded and it's something that we're quite excited about. Upon secondary analysis, the highest association of directional preference prediction was mechanical stress. And mechanical stress was inversely related to directional preference, and I'll touch on uh, some examples of that later in the presentation. The second most associated variable was directional vulnerability at 66%, followed by painful movement at 53%, and obstructive movement at 46%. Some other significant findings that we found that I think is quite relevant to, to the, the weekend's uh, teachings here. Uh, all patients with central symmetrical symptoms require loading strategies only in the sagittal plane. Patients with asymptomatic or asymmetrical uh, location responded to both sagittal and lateral loading strategies. Of the seven patients, uh, demonstrating the directional preference for, for seven patients that demonstrated uh, directional preference had a full abolishment of all pain on initial examination, and five required a change of directional preference upon reevaluation. Uh, and I, I noticed I have a poster out there, and a lot of the, the younger uh, people in the conference have been taking uh, pictures of the loading strategies. Uh, want to take pictures of this again, it's probably going to be two years until you're able to see them again, so feel free, it won't be disrespectful to me if you want to uh, get a picture. Uh, so of the patients exhibiting directional preference, two required loaded wrist flexion, which is depicted by the picture, and uh, three required loaded wrist extension. Three patients required unloaded wrist flexion, and one required unloaded wrist flexion with medial overpressure. One patient required unloaded supination with a high velocity whip, and another required unsu unloaded supination, and I'll, I'll slow this down because this is, this is one of the most I think interesting loading strategies that we found is something that I've never done before and I've never done again. Uh, and the process of finding it is actually that will be available in the manuscript, uh, hopefully when it's published. Uh, for time's sake, I didn't include that. And also, uh, I want everyone here to be excited about it and read the paper when it comes out. So you got something to look forward to. Uh, but uh, anyway, the uh, movement is unloaded supination with anterior overpressure pressure to the distal radius and posterior overpressure to the first metacarpal during supination. Three patients required wrist flexion with traction and one required pronation with traction. Prior to this report, the only two published wrist directional preference procedures that I know of at least were wrist extension and ulnar deviation. Now, this is significant uh, because if only these procedures were used, the directional preference prevalence in our sample would have only been 20%. Through the use of additional loading strategies, this report, as I stated before, found 79% of patients to have a matched directional preference, which is far greater than the currently established prevalence rates of 40, 37, and 19. Other clinically relevant findings were the association of obstructive movement and painful movement. This suggests that clinicians who intuitively attempt to restore range of motion with the most restricted movement would only have success in less than half of their patients. Alternatively, if 53% of people's directional preference was their most painful movement, clinicians should not necessarily avoid movement testing into the patient's most painful movement. 
because this may become their directional properties. The association of mechanical stress and directional preference in spinal disorders is well documented and understood. In the lumbar spine, a common presentation is patients who are exposed to excessive lumbar flexion. This patient is commonly managed with MDT extension principle. The most common finding in our report was the inverse relationship between excessive mechanical stress and directional preference. This opposite mechanical relationship is of interest given 75% of patients exposed to excessive wrist extension require the opposite movement, wrist flexion. Two similar cases were documented in our findings. One, an elderly woman who spent her leisurely hours crocheting a pastime she reported as putting her wrist into excessive flexion. Her directional preference, also opposite wrist extension. Another, a fry cook who spent most working hours pronating her wrist, her directional preference was also opposite wrist supination. Although wrist and lumbar anatomy differ greatly, there appears to be a similar biomechanical relationship present. As in the spine, extremity directional preference may, more easily, may be more easily recognized from thorough understanding of the patient's successive mechanical stress. This report provides preliminary evidence in finding directional preference of the wrist. If directional preference can be more easily identified in the extremities, its prevalence should continue to increase. Although further research is required, and something that I encourage all the members uh, of, of this conference to participate in, because it's important. And again, if only the two published movements were used, the only evidence that we found, we'd only have a 20% pre prevalence rate in this study. And if my father, let me have only 20% of our patients getting better, I'd be out of work. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, <laughs> that process is tough, and I almost gave up on it. On my first, on my first study, I was, I was uh, rejected, and I said, this is horrible. I just spent a year working on overdrive to try to get this thing uh, published, and, I, and it was completely ripped to shreds. And I said, why would I ever do that again? I, at that point, I still didn't know you could potentially get paid. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, 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 in talking to some other people and hearing that that's, that is uh, something that happens, it gave me some confidence again and, and made me do it again. And, and I'm, I'm, it's the most satisfying feeling to have my presentation out there be published and for people to be excited about it. And, and I can't believe that it was referenced here, actually. It, 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 I, I'm really proud of that. Thank you so much. Uh, for acknowledging it and, and taking the time to read it. Uh, it means a lot to me. Um, and, and on that note, if anyone here that has done a poster or is interested in research, uh, a little bit of guidance can go a long way. And if anyone wants to reach out to me, my personal email is my name, josephrmassio at gmail.com. Shoot me an email. You know, Again, a little bit of guidance often is helpful. And you know, going through that process once, I'm certainly no expert, uh, but I think I've figured out a few things to make the process a little smoother. So I, I'd be glad to share that with anyone that's, that's interested in doing so. Um, before we all rush out of here, back, back to where we're from, two final points to remember for the weekend, for me at least. In regards to testing the most painful movement, it's okay if it hurts, because 53% of people are doing it. Additionally, stretching what's tight might not be right. Keep that in mind. Uh, special thanks to the Kennedy Institute for putting on such an amazing uh, conference, and also uh, to, again, my place of employment, Massive Physical Therapy, who is coincidentally celebrating 30 years of excellence this year. So thank you so much.